Welcome, welcome, welcome. Good evening, everyone. This is uh, um, we're joining in for the session. Can we trust the fans? Uh, my name is Sangeet Paul Chaudhary, and uh, I'm the founder of Platformation Labs and uh, the author of several books, including um, Platform Revolution. And I'll be chairing this session. Uh, now, this topic, uh, can we trust the fans, is, is a topic that's that's gained a lot of uh, traction over the last few years. And uh, to discuss this, we have several uh, very esteemed guests on our panel, and I'm just going to go around introducing all of them. We have two um, uh, that we have on the screen, and we have a couple joining in shortly as well. So joining me today, uh, we have Angel uh, Cabrera, um, esteemed academic and president of the Georgia Institute of Technology. Uh, we will have uh, Karim al uh CEO of Medjalikan, and uh, we have Samir Patil, CEO of Scrollstack, and Victor Schmidt, uh, chairman and co-founder of uh, NetGuru. So to kick, kick off this session, I just want to kind of talk about why this topic is important today. And I'm just going to start off with some opening comments um, on this. When we think about the fans, Facebook, Apple, Netflix, Google, you could add Amazon, Alibaba, depending on how many A's you want to stretch the, uh, right in between. All of these are the so-called big tech platform companies that have gained huge scale over the last two decades. Until around 2015, we did not really care about that a lot because till around 2015, uh, we used to uh, we used to uh, just go with uh, Google's um, "Don't be evil" slogan and Facebook's you know moving fast, and we were okay if it broke a few things. And well, all of these companies were looked like scrappy startups that were kind of challenging the status quo. But over the last five to six years, we've really woken up to the fact, regulators, uh, the rest of the business world, everybody's woken up to the fact that there is a dark side to the rise of this huge platform businesses as well. And I just want to kind of frame some ideas for this discussion as we, as we go into this. So when we think about, um, uh, about the fans, what, what, what's really important is that there are several elements because of which these these companies exercise almost anti-competitive power not because they are uh, you know inherently evil or not because they're of any malintent but just because their their market power and the design uh, options that they've chosen help them help put them in that position of, of power so if you think of a few different things two of these companies Facebook and Google have kind of built their business model around advertising at scale. And that advertising at scale uh, comes from harvesting user attention, which in turn comes from using algorithms to uh, keep users engaged, often at the risk of promoting fake news, uh, encouraging extremism, and so on. And uh, what that also does uh, is, is there's uh, data privacy issues that we've seen with the Cambridge Analytica scandal and others. More importantly, all of these companies, because they have huge scale in aggregating a market audience, they take on this position of, of market dominance and can start um, engaging in a whole range of anti-competitive uh, moves from there. One move could be that these companies themselves start participating in the market, whether it's Amazon as a retailer or Google with its shopping case, uh, you know, favoring its shopping site over competitors because of its search dominance. Uh, they also end up commoditizing a lot of these market participants. Uh, we've seen many examples of how merchants get commoditized increasingly on Amazon. Um, and there's not necessarily a, a connection between the, the amount of power that these companies get hold of and the amount of responsibility that they take on for it. Because Facebook, for instance, or YouTube has uh, a lot of power over, con over controlling the market, but not necessarily the responsibility of what happens with the content. And increasingly, we've started seeing questions around whether these companies are fair, whether they're kind of promoting uh, certain partners. Uh, and with uh, you know Trump getting banned this year, there were questions around whether these companies are actually now working like cartels, where they're working, coming together to, to make uh, cr cross-platform uh, decisions. So with those opening comments, I just want to kind of open this up for the panel. I just, I'd just like to hear, gentlemen, from your perspective, um, how, how do you think about where the fans have landed uh, in, in today's world, the market power that they have? Um, whether you want to take a pro-fan approach or an anti-fan approach, would love to hear your opening comments on how you see uh, the fans shaping up. Uh, Anil, would you like to open up with, with your comments on this? 
Uh, sure, uh, Sangeet, and, and thank you for that um, opening statement. I think frames frames the issues um, very well. Uh, this is extremely complex, and and I think one of the things we've learned is that old antitrust tools that simply won't cut it to deal with these issues. Uh, these are these are technologies and these are phenomena that society has never dealt with. I mean, we know how to deal with an oil monopoly or with a telecom monopoly, and, and the legal tools evolved to deal with those. We have no idea how to deal with a platform monopoly, if you will, or quasi-monopoly or, or a, a network uh, monopoly. And it's very difficult because um, you know, we, we, if, if you think about the very way these platforms create value is because of their size. So... You cannot simply say, I'm going to chop them up and that's going to solve the problem. Uh, in fact, the reason why we can have access to Netflix content, um, unprecedented amount of content like we've never seen at a pretty moderate price is because they're large and because they can produce content that will appeal to viewers and somewhere in the world, and there will be a market for every new film or any new documentary that they produce, right? The reason why Facebook or the reason why Twitter work is because all of us are on those platforms providing value to one another. So you, you chop them up and you're destroying the value that they're creating for us, including all the good things that we get from those platforms. So size itself won't cut it. Uh, price won't cut it either. I mean, you say, well, you know, traditional monopolies use the position of power to to rack up the prices. Well, how about zero price for the consumer? How about you can get your account on uh, uh, Facebook for free? Of course, we know it's not free. We know there is a revenue model behind it. Um, that we know we're paying with 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 our data. We know we're paying with uh, the access to advertisers and so forth. But from a consumer standpoint, if they're charging you zero, what is the charge in terms of uh, monopoly of you? So bottom line is all those sort of the old tools we had will not deal with a, with a, with a, with a content, with a current problem. So we have to think about it differently. And, and what we cannot do anymore is to think that technology can run over here and then have, uh, if you will, uh, the philosophical, ethical, legal issues, uh, be an afterthought. Uh, at Georgia Tech, uh, we are, uh, you know, we, we, we're, we're one of the, the largest technological universities in, in the United States. We, we have over a billion dollars worth of, of research grants at, every year. We one of the largest programs in computer science anywhere in the world. And and um, and what we're trying to do is to is to actually combine those disciplines early on. I want to make sure that the next founder of, uh, of of Facebook, the next founder of Twitter, again, it's not like oh look how cool this tool is. We'll figure out this unintended consequences later. We have those have to be built into the algorithms. Those have, those have to be built into what we do, and then, and then regulation as well. Regulation has to keep up with this technology. For example, uh, and and I'll, I'll I'll close my opening statement there, Cindy. But um, it may not be a price or a size uh, factor mm -hmm. that we use to to chop or to deal with those problems. It may be in user protection. For it, it could be, for example, working on on the right, providing the rights of users to own their data, to port their data to a different platform. Right? I mean that, if you will, it, it, what you what you want is freedom of choice, right? That That's what you want, right? So uh, to have that freedom of choice, you have to somehow return the power. Now that's easier said than done and technologically, it's not clear how that would be done, but I, I suspect that that's an area of, of great promise to figure out how to return the power to the user. So the user has the real option. You can say, well, you have the option now, except that you cannot. You cannot transport your data from Facebook to the next platform. Figuring out that uh, idea of, of uh, data portability may be at least one area of, of great promise in my in my view. I'll, I'll turn it back to you. Sure. No, thanks for sharing that. And, I, and I'll come back to some of those comments because data portability is certainly something I'd love to get deeper into. Uh, but Kareem, I'd love to hear your thoughts uh, from, the, from the industry side. How do you see this and how do you how, how does this uh, issue impact you as you run your business as well well actually uh, thank you for uh, the introduction thank both of you uh, for the opening comments I believe that uh, from my own perspective 
because the, the problem is not mainly about trust, it's uh, mainly about access. So, um, as uh, as uh, Angela Cabrera uh, said, and you yourself said, it's difficult to apply uh, traditional tools to gauge this situation. Uh, but the thing is, it's not about technology itself, because technology is a tool, after all, it's not, technology is not uh, a paradigm, uh, it's not a lifestyle, it's, it's a tool to get to a meeting, uh, to get to an end using the means. And I believe that you got so that issue is in the nature. These companies, whatever the company is, they own information. They own, not the information itself, but they own the access to information. And they act as information filters. So if you have the freedom of choice, everyone has freedom of choice at one way or another. But the thing is, with that freedom, you don't, you don't, really, you don't really get to do much without access to tools, to do whatever your freedom allows you. From that perspective, there have been larger companies, if, if, yeah, relatively, there have been larger com companies uh, in the world uh, throughout history. But the thing is, they didn't really own access to our information. These companies shaped right. our opinion, uh, public opinion, shaped our uh, political opinion, economical behavior, uh, customer, consumer behavior, and even how business conduct. And even if you, you take Netflix, Netflix, it's not about entertainment only. It's entertainment if it looks to films and so on, but this has cultural side. But if you go to something like climate change, and you go to uh, their latest, one of their latest documentaries about uh, uh, our planet, I believe, and it talks about uh, how we're miserably uh, just uh, destroying our, uh, our planet and stuff. That's a perspective, and that's actually a political perspective. And shapes public opinion, even that. And when you take that to social networks and, and, and search engines, it's magnified. And we have all seen problems with taxation overseas, even in Europe, with these companies. We've seen the platforming of many people, whether you agree with them or not, but for a company to de platform the sitting president of the United States, that's, a mm -hmm. that's, that's quite a thing. And it does not say much about the company itself. But it says something about the alignment of them. So, my comment will end here because what I believe that it's yes, it's access to information, it's size, economical size, political weight, and alignment with power and uh, authority. So, these companies are filters to escape, and that's a huge challenge. You can, you can apply. You can apply antitrust uh, rules to such companies. You can do that. But the problem is that even if you chop up, chop them up, and as uh, uh, Mr. Cabrera has just said, well, the, the value is driven from the size. But even if you chop them up, how would you stop the next company from doing the same thing? And the, 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 the more important question. Okay, so ha, ha, do the do such companies help democratize access to information or shield information? When you shield information, you become uh, you become the our best, sir. So you, you control how people just do, and that's what has been done. And this is not about you know chopping them up or breaking them, because there are lots of alignments when it comes to that. Mm -hmm. The thing is, is to come with a more innovative way of doing things of in, of information flows, and that's the main challenge. Yeah, no, that's that's great. I think uh, 
you know, right in this first question, we've kind of, just in the opening comments, we've uncovered several issues. I'll just quickly summarize. So we've talked about the fact that it's not necessarily malintent. It's actually in the nature of how these companies are designed. And then we've talked about the issue of agency, which, uh, you know, Angel, your point was about data portability can give some agency back to the user. Uh, otherwise, there's this very... Uh, you know, benevolent lock-in that gets created. The more that I use the platform, the more useful it becomes, but then I cannot switch beyond that. And so that's that's another set of issues, uh, market access, and, and we'll, we'll get to that in more detail as well. And uh, Kareem, your points about uh, uh, the political tie-in are actually very interesting as well, because uh, all of these companies have hired senior Washington executives. Uh, and they've hired senior policy executives around the world. And uh, if you just look at some of the hearings that some of these companies went through, uh, you can see that they've, they've kind of primed themselves for uh, getting getting that part right. So, I, yeah. Just I have a point here because uh, I didn't want to be misunderstood when it comes to that. The thing is, every, every large company or every corporate, large corporate, even mm -hmm. a small company, Try to make, inputs. that's okay. Sure. That's how the world is run. That's how business is conducted. So it's it's not the biggest deal. The thing is, there is a unique challenge when it comes to. I'm I'm not. You're not. You're not trading a plastic bag here. You're trading a public opinion. You're trading how I perceive the world, and that's a very different topic. Sure. Absolutely. Well, let's let's you know let's take all of these things uh, one at a time. And I'd like to first get started with uh, this topic about data portability because there's a question in the comments also on this on this issue. So um, that, that's something that's that's been a big theme of my work as well. Um, data portability, uh, you know, to a large extent, the fans or in general any of the big tech companies complain that data is how we protect our innovation data is is the, or or rather controlling the data is the incentive to innovate so if you if you enable data portability you'll you'll end up in the situation where you cannot innovate any longer but then i uh, i mean my view on this is that there are two aspects to it there is uh, um, a base layer of data portability that can be allowed uh, especially when it comes to recognizing negative actors. So let's take the example, for instance, of, of Uber. And Uber has this reputation system based on which drivers are kicked out or they are held on. And um, typically, compared to other reputation systems, Is, is actually that you just use data portability as a way to identify bad actors across the board and uh, help help that uh, help uh, you know uh, the platforms in in, uh, in in not having to reinvent the wheel and through that get access to um, uh, you know enable more competition. But then whatever is required to excel on the platform, that becomes the platform's unique data. So that's one view that, that has been talked about in terms of creating this dual reputation system. The second view is using data portability as a way to negotiate, which is that if tomorrow, for instance, you could have a user API, uh, you should have a way by which a third-party application can use your user API to negotiate with the platform. And uh, there's there have been implementations of this where Artists, for instance, there's an, actually a label that negotiates with YouTube on behalf of the artists by using al algorithmically looking for the artists' uh, music signatures in pirated videos and then negotiating that amount from YouTube. So there's been, um, you know, discussion on creating this collective action on behalf of the users. So I'll just throw out those two points. Uh, I, I'd love to hear your perspectives on how you think data portability should be implemented, if at all, and uh, you know how would you address the issues that a lot of these tech companies raise? That if you set up data portability, you're going to end up in a situation where you're going to discourage innovation. So uh, I'll start with you, Kareem, this time. Uh, how do you think about that? Well, I absolutely disagree with this perspective. The thing is, even from a very moral and legal uh, perspective, my behavior is not yours to set. You're just selling it because you, you, you're shielding the access to it. And because, well, I'm a, I don't 
know the value of my behavior, so you just use it on my own behalf for your own benefit. That's not a very good perspective when you look uh, on it like that. But the thing about data portability and innovation, well, innovation does not build on monopoly. Monopoly kills innovation, not the other way around. The thing about implementing data portability is, well, okay, that aligns very well with what I was saying uh, a few minutes ago, which is things have to be done in a different way. I believe the future should go to a decentralized way of doing things so nobody has ultimate authority mm -hmm. on the, the information flow, especially if I own my own data, which is mine. I should own it. You shouldn't right. be using it on, on, on my own behalf. So if we, if we start with decentralized platforms, much of these problems will be solved. We will have to deal with other sets of problems. But the problem of ownership will be at least to a good degree solved. Great. Well, let me go back to the decentralized platforms as well. But yes, Angel, would love to hear your thoughts on that. Well, you know, here's what I'm, what I'm thinking. This, uh, by the way, great, terrific discussion. I'm appreciating your, your perspectives very much. But I'm, I'm an educator, right? That's what we do at Georgia Tech. So... Um, and and there, there are two factors here at play. One is what can the law do to limit the potential harm that right. very large, very influential platforms can have? And I think both, both of you have done a great job of highlighting where those risks are. And the law has a, a great uh, role to play. But the, the law is not going to fix the whole thing, right? The, the law is just going to set up the boundaries of, of, of what's going to be excessive harm, if you will. So the law can get into what is it okay to have in a user contract when, when you say yes to all the options that you never read. Uh, you know, what is, a, what is an okay contract between me as a user and, and, and Facebook or, or whatever platform I'm using? But the companies themselves within the law have a huge moral and philosophical responsibility. And, and, and it is absolutely essential that, I mean, these companies need to, just like you have a chief technology officer, and just like you need to have a chief philosophy officer, you need to have a chief ethical officer, you need to have cadres of well-trained um, uh, political philosophers that, that are really thinking it through. I mean, thinking about the implications, this can no longer be trial and error. You cannot just say, "Oops!" I mean, we just somehow participated in a whole uh, in a whole movement of misinformation that may have actually tilted the election of one of the biggest countries in, in, in the world. Oops, we didn't know. Of course, you know that there is so much. So, so it is absolutely essential as an educator. What I'm trying to figure out is how are we producing folks who are building that thinking into the algorithms from the get go. Right. It's not just what are the boundaries that you can play against is actually what is the backbone of what a good uh, social network, for example, uh, the, the good that it should be doing for society. Right. No, that's that's an interesting and fascinating aspect because you raised the topic about education and uh, a lot of the education over the last 10 to 12 years have started veering uh, towards creating um, you know, to, to, towards uh, minting graduates who can who can who can work at these companies, and so um, there, there there are a couple of issues that that kind of come up over there, right? I mean, uh, one of the facts is that um, one of the issues over here is that uh, there's been much more research over the last ten years about behavior design, about user psychology, and about exploiting that uh, in in through product design. And the second thing is uh, the second thing that's that we've seen a lot of is just um, taking a lot of principles from financial engineering and taking that into advertising, uh, where you know in, in finance ultimately you 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 reduce everything into a set of numbers, and over here you're reducing every uh, every human action, human motivation into a set of numbers, and so to a large extent. Uh, a lot of this dehumanization has happened in education itself. I mean, would you agree with that? Would you disagree with that? I'd love to hear your perspective as an educator on that. Well, I know, in fact, 
uh, that's exactly what I'm what I'm what I'm talking about. That that we can no longer ignore these issues. From I mean, I'm trying to be self-critical, right? I mean, when when you are uh, you know Georgia Tech, MIT, Stanford, what you know when we are producing. Uh, the, the the next um, you know the 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 CEOs and the software engineers of these platforms and the new wave of platforms we can elude that we cannot just forget that responsibility and it is right. not just about how do we train you in the latest tools of you know of of, of machine learning and, and 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 networks and the like it's is are we somehow equipping you with uh, with the frameworks and the intellectual tools to even understand. I mean, I'm I'm going to assume that most of the folks who join uh, uh, any of the fangs really uh, would like to see themselves as 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 good individuals trying to make a good a, a good influence and have uh, make some value in the world. Well, you know, when you're asked to program an algorithm that uh, that is going that, that that you know that is intentionally going to radicalize your thinking, the way the algorithm is built. I mean, you should be able to recognize that and call it and, and have a discussion and, and, and figure out internally what it, is that what we want our company to, to do? Is that our business model? So I know it might be a little naive, but it is essential that the, the, the folks that we're producing at least have the capacity to have uh, those, those kinds of conversations. In addition to what we do from the legal standpoint, I'm not saying it's one or the other. I think we, we have to work on both sides. Uh, thanks for sharing that, Angels. Uh, and uh, Karim, I'd love to, uh, you know, kind of bring up one of the topics that you talked about, that decentralization could be, uh, you know, a solution to this. And, uh, you know, especially with uh, NFTs coming in now, uh, there's a lot more possibility to push back the agency towards the user. They are based to reward the user in ways that were not possible in the past, you would expect. But I, I just want to talk about one, one issue over here, which, which comes up quite often. What has led to the rise of these big companies is actually venture capital. It's the concentration of capital with with a few venture capitalists, and uh, you know those company those uh, funds working together to push some of these companies. And and to, at some points, it's uh, happened uh, even in a way where users have been subsidized all the way till IPO. So if you look at, for example, a company like Uber, users are still being subsidized over there. Uh, we still not have we still not reached a place where it's being self funded. So. When you think about the fact that these companies require such excessive funding and uh, the venture capitalists benefit from the concentration of returns back to the center, how would you how do, how do you think that plays out in the decentralized world? Because we've had uh, you know ICOs and other ways to fund things in the past, and it's it's not really been sustainable. And a lot of the networks that we've seen in uh, decentralization that have come up have ended up being either closed networks or uh, you know really small uh, scale networks. So how do you create a global scale network with a decentralized ownership? Very good question. Uh, but let's look back about uh, 25 years, 30 years ago. Elon Musk, he was mm -hmm. running uh, uh, in a, uh, a company with the big boom, uh, dot com boom. Now he has his, the first or the second, I'm not running that, uh, richest, the most richest, out of technological companies. So, Time change, and uh, yes, and lots of IPOs, ICOs, whatever decentralization, which is a hit and run, which happens with every way of innovation. So that's not the end. Yet. Well, actually, when we look at banks, people started banks by robbing people. <laughs> that's history, by the way. So yeah, until things got stabilized, stabilized, which is the norm. But how to build a uh, decentralized platform that is sustainable? That's a very good question. First of all, if the platform is stupid, it will not be sustainable. And stupid, yes, compared to Google, they have very smart platform. They have an intelligent platform that uses quite a bit of artificial intelligence. But can this be applied in a decentralized way? Well, that's a, a problem to solve, and that's actually a problem that we're working on. Uh, but once you can apply decentralized intelligence, things become a lot better. So you can have a decentralized intelligent platform that can still work. 
And when you do self-organization, and by self-organization, I mean not just 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 not everybody is familiar with that. But so when 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 I mean uh, when I when I say self-organization, I mean that the platform has the ability to manage itself without inflicting or without without pushing for uh, a specific perspective. And for example, if we take Bitcoin, for example, it's a uh, very small, very small uh, percentage of its users can de dedicate how the network is run, which is not decentralized in that sense of the world. So that's one thing. That's uh, it, it may be a decentralized asset, but the decision making and the value making of that asset is not decentralized. So that's uh, a very contradictory uh, perspective. But what, what when I'm talking about cyber organization, I'm talking about intelligence cyber organization that is split between people, the users of that network, and the machines that run that network and can decide on small things in their own right to make that work. So it's, it's, it's think of it like a, a system that is a political system, a society system, whatever kind of system that you want to have as a metaphor. A good system is sustainable once it gives people the options to make decisions without much constraints, within a set of constraints that can change. And that, that that's the definition of democracy. That's the very uh, fundamental definition of democracy. But there is also the dictatorship of the mob, which that is Bitcoin, for example. <laughs> so, but, uh, well, a mob can be a number, can be uh, uh, lots of people, or can be very powerful people. And that comes back to your venture capitalist uh, kind of uh, discussion. Yes, things has um, uh, things have been done this way for quite a long time, not a very long time, but by the way, throughout history, uh, maybe for the last uh, thirty to forty years. But uh, is that system sustainable to begin with? Well, actually, in two thousand nineteen and eighteen, uh, a group uh, commissioned by the UN, uh, Secretary General. Uh, well, they attested to the fact that this uh, system is not going to be sustained for long. So, as we as we innovate with the system itself to decentralize it, we have to innovate with making value for it and to make it acquire value in ways that are different from the traditional ones. And to do that, you have to give user both value choice. And for you. Great. No, I, uh, that's 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 very helpful. Yeah, um, we have we're probably towards the end of uh, the discussion. We have maybe six more minutes. So just to wrap this up, I, I'd I'd like to just uh, you know um, ask both of you to leave us with some mental models of how should regulators think about fangs, right? And we've talked talked about a few mental models today. We've talked about agency as one way of thinking about. Well, information asymmetry, the, the, the point you talked about, information asymmetry, data harvesting, a lot of these things are fundamentally about agency, where the, the platform has much more power over data and information than you do. And so that, uh, that creates an exploitative relationship in terms of how the platform can use your data. Uh, another set of uh, mental models have been around monopoly versus monopsony, because uh, Amazon may not seem like a monopoly, but it, it certainly is a monopsony if you look at it from the supplier perspective. Uh, commoditization is another mental model. So I'd just love to hear from your perspectives. And Angel, I'd, I'd like to, love to start with you. Uh, right. uh, yeah, no, I'm, that's a great question, Sangeet. And, and the, 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 there's no easy answer, for example. There is a mental model or the legal model, which we have right. used as of the public utility, right? I mean, you could say, well, Let's say if if these networks um, are by almost necessity going to end up being uh, a monopoly, then let's just regulate them just like we regulate the power companies. Mm -hmm. That model breaks down very quickly uh, yeah. because because would you want to have only 
one uh, search engine <laughs> or one. I mean, and the 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 implications of that are are really frightening because uh, we know every search engine. Every I mean, so so that is the 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 public utility framework doesn't doesn't work. The size framework doesn't work. The um, the price even the price doesn't work in the sense that. The, at least the price for the for the user doesn't work because in many cases the price is zero, or yeah. or it's lower than it's than it's been. Right? I mean, you you can you can complain whatever you want about Netflix or uh, or Spotify, but the reality is that right now I'm spending far less money in music in in real dollars than I did when I was a teenager in Spain, and I'm mm -hmm. getting more music. So so none of those frameworks work. And and I think uh, really the, the, there's got to be a new a new framework and and something around the I, I, I suspect again and this is not a very well formulated thought but there's got to be a framework a way of thinking about this about about that sort of uh, uh, contract with the devil that we sign when we accept all the you know what is it that I'm giving to the platform in exchange for this uh, seemingly free service I mean I think that's and, and the morality of, of what is it okay to uh, to provide in exchange for the for the search? I think that, but, but we don't have an existing framework right. to, to deal with that. No, thanks for your comments. And could, could you any any final thoughts on you on this topic? On well, regulators, well, I don't think regulators work. Regulators just um, we don't want monotony, right? But actually, if you give it to regulators, that's what will happen. That's that's. Again, with alignment with political agendas and political disturb disturbances, and you give that to regulators, wow, we have something that's not very, very uh, well maintained, to say the least. So it's better to innovate in a new direction. I agree with that. Great. Um, I think we are almost on time. So thanks for, for both of your comments, and, and uh, uh, thank you for your time discussing this. And so. Um, uh, thanks again. I think uh, we're right. the session now. Okay. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank okay. you, guys. Thank, Thank you. you.